So how much? Uh, so you mentioned that you you know you you originally chatted back and forth with Musk. How how's that? How oh yeah, he was he, he was. I did a lot of interviewing with him for the book, and um, but originally it was supposed to be I just sort of sit at his feet and say, "What's your vision of going to Mars? <laughs> how you're going to do it?" Yeah. And after you know, I ate up a couple hours of his time. One of his people pulled me aside and they said, "You know how we value his time." At Tesla and SpaceX, and I said no, three hundred thousand dollars an hour. That's how we allocate it. So <laughs> you just ate up more than a half a million dollars yeah. worth of time. Well, and I said, oh. <laughs> well, I know that he did like um, uh, he did a, like a whole bunch of interviews with Wait, but why? Yes, and same. Kind he loves of, that guy. Yeah, 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 and it was just like he wanted to do it, and so that's that. Well, the, you know the the uh, Tim who does the Wait. But why stuff is um, even more optimistic than Musk and doesn't ask a lot of penetrating journalistic questions. Right. Um, so I think there was, he, you know, Musk is very wary of the media, yeah. very wary. Yeah. And so I think he saw in Tim a kindred spirit right. and um, somebody who wouldn't be too mean to him. I'd be the same. I'd softball him. I agree. I, I know. It's just, you know, we'd just be talking about Oh, you'd softball him? I, no, I yeah. I, I did not softball him, but you know what? <laughs> if, so, <clears throat> so Elon Musk, if you ever want to show up on the Weekly Space Hangout, I will absolutely sell out my journalistic integrity if you want to uh, come and have a fun <laughs> chat. That's, uh, that's a promise. Although, you know, we had um, the folks from uh, Mars One and... You know, I, I suspect they probably regretted coming to this on the show. Good. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, hey, everybody, we're going to um, do a show here, which we like to call uh, the Weekly Space Hangout. I'm going to say hi to a bunch of you. Hello to Adam Synergy, Alex, Alexis Desplond, uh, Anti Fusion, Arnold Post, Bill K, Billy Gordon, Brian Stab, Carolyn B, Chirag Kahar. Colin Jones, Connor Lennon, Fleming Thunberg, Galaxia, Gareth Blake, Giselle Sabrin, Henrik Bo Anderson, James Aberson, John Gallant, John Seffel, Johnny Zed, Linda Sadek, Malcolm Bond, Matt Minter, Michael Jobin, Michael Jobin? Jobin? You gotta tell me how to say that. Nancy Graziano, Nichols of the Yard, Neil Geary, Ocean McIntyre, Raza Siddiqui, Book winner, Raza Siddiqui, Refurio and Acro, Richard Clark, Rick Schwartz, Tech Tang, Thomas Traniker, Tori Gadwa, William Bacon, and Zap Van Zap Van. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Uh, so we'll just take another couple of minutes, and then we will uh, get cranked. People are noticing that you have a new haircut. I do have a new haircut, no, yes. We, 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 were talk, we were talking to Paul here. Yeah. Oh, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your hair I, shaved it. I shaved it two days ago. Yeah. Yeah. Three yeah. days ago. So, you know, it looks yeah. a little shorter. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Is, is that like a post doctorate hair? You're just like, this This uh, hair has so much sadness and work involved, and now it's time for it to go? You know, I'd like to say so. I think the timing was just coincidental. Uh, every couple of years, I cut my hair really short after growing it out, and I donate it to the different charities that. Oh, that's make cool. Sure. For children with hair loss from you know medical conditions and whatnot, uh, the timing happened to be pretty coincidental that it was right after the PhD, <laughs> and right as summer was coming up, so it all sort of you know coincided nicely. But yeah, every so often I cut up cut off like more than a foot long of hair. So that's that's oh, my only... explanation too. <laughs> yeah, I mean yours is very different too, right? Yeah, it's very different. Lost the sideburns. That's that's the new. Man. And that was that I almost was, didn't recognize you. That was a mistake. That was an accident, and now I think they're gone for good. So it never grows back. <laughs> Not coming back. Uh, all right, cool. Well, I think we're ready to go. Um, you're all comfortable, ready to go. I'm gonna change the view here. Oh, Kimberly, all the time. There's me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll Nancy's saying I thought Noisy was going to be here. Yeah, we thought that um, yeah. Nicole would be here, but she is not. I miss you, Nicole. Come back. Yeah, we miss you, Nicole. Come back. Um, that's ready to go. That's good. That's good. Okay, great. I think we're we're as ready as we can be.
All right, here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, May 26, 2017. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we've got a bunch of stories. We got a whole bunch of information on Boyage and Star. We're going to be talking about a new class of planet. And uh, do gravitational waves uh, impart permanent ripples into space-time, among other things. Joining me this week, we've got Dr. Kimberly Cartier. Dr. Cartier. Hello, Welcome Fraser. Back. Hello, viewers. Thank you. Happy Friday and happy summer, if it's summer on your side of the hemisphere. So is it appropriate now from here on out, I just call you Dr. Cartier? Sure. All right. Yeah, you know, as long I will never as I can you remember. That. Because I know that there is a tendency, even though you are a respected doctor, able to perform surgery on... I can prescribe you a dose of science. <laughs> exactly. Uh, there's a tendency to, to go back to calling people by their first names. So, um, I, you know, I need to balance that respect. But you've got a new gig coming up? I do, yes. Uh, in a few weeks, I'll be starting a new job at the American Geophysical Union. And I'll be writing Earth and Space Science news for EOS Magazine. Awesome. So soon you will be presenting stories that you wrote for EOS Magazine. Exactly. Perfect. Uh, joining us as well, we've got Dr. Paul Matt Sutter. Yeah, and you, I want you to keep calling me doctor, doctor please. Well, is it just Dr. Sutter? Thing. Well, hold on. Is it Dr. Sutter? Is it Dr. Matt Sutter? Dr. Well, Matt, Matt Sutter? Matt is just a middle name. You can just call me Paul Sutter if you want. All right. Or Dr. Paul. Sutter. Or Dr. Sutter. Okay. Or right. Paul Sutter, PhD. Paul He's Sutter, so PhD, Sutter. astrophysics. Uh, physics. The, the doctor is just in physics. Okay. All right. You also can prescribe science? Uh, and I would like to point out we are the original doctors before these medical practitioners stole the title to try and take some respectability for themselves. Right. You, came first. you guys came first. Awesome. All right. And uh, joining us this week, we've got a special guest, Stephen Petranik. Stephen, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Thanks. Great to be here. Let's see. It still just wants to show Paul Matt Sutter. Maybe you need to say more Can't words. Blame it. <laughs> I need to say more words. There we go. There we go. Now you've now you've Hi, popped everybody. into the screen. Uh, awesome. So so uh, we're gonna do a quick uh, interview with you, Stephen. I mean, people are gonna really enjoy what you've got to say. Uh, but before we do, I need, I've got a couple more uh, public service announcements to do. Number one, just remember this is a live event. Go ahead if you've got a question for me for the guests. Uh, go ahead and put it into the chat, either in the YouTube chat if you're watching it there, or in the Weekly Space Hangout crew chat, which is coming from Slack. If you're not a member of the crew, go to wshcrew.space, and we will be able to uh, have you uh, join this chat down here where some of the questions are coming in. It's great crew, totally free, and they really are the producers of this show. I had no idea that uh, Stephen Petranik was going to be coming on the show. I just showed up like I do, and here he is in the Hangout, uh, already chosen and prepped by by the crew. So uh, it's uh, it's wonderful. All right, so Stephen, uh, now, yes. now is it a doctor? Are you a doctor too? Am I the only non-doctor here? I am not a doctor. Okay. I'm a master's, and there's no title for that. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so why don't you let people know uh, who you are and what you do? Well, um, I'm a journalist, and I've been a science journalist most of my life. Um, I was an editor at Life magazine. I was the editor of the Washington Post magazine. Uh, for many years, I was the editor of Discover, which at one time was the world's largest science magazine, at least when I was there. And um, I'm working on another book right now. And, um, and I'm also working very hard on the second series of National Geographic's Mars program, which is based on my book. I've been writing really strange little bits in the script about <laughs> I have to add the science to all the stuff and kind of double check everything. So we're working on season two right now. Uh, so for people who maybe missed season one, uh, what was the what was the series that you worked on for for Nat Geo? Well, it's a six part series based on the book, and it's basically the first trip to Mars and the first setup of of a small colony on mars based on an international consortium going there and um it's a six one-hour episodes 
And it ran um, from about just before Thanksgiving until the end of the year. And in the second um, six episodes will run in the spring of 2018. So about a year from now. And how involved were you? So like your book, like it was, it was a, you know, I haven't seen the whole thing, but from what I understand, it was a very, it was sort of a mixture of sort of science and telling sort of the, the background information, but also sort of dramatization of what people might go through and fairly science. Uh... Yeah, the, the, the trick here was to try to decide what would get a large enough audience and if we did a straight documentary series, um, there was kind of a choice between doing what's called a feature documentary, and that's like one hour, two hours, uh, almost never three hours. And we felt like there was so much stuff here to get through um, and so much fascinating stuff that it would be better if we could try to make it a mini series. And the only way you can really make a mini series now is to have some kind of entertainment value to it, so-called entertainment value. So we came up with this hybrid thing that had never been tried before in which about the first half or about half of the 60 minutes um, every week was a documentary based very, very strictly on science. Um, I was a I was sort of the super fact checker on it, as was Dr. Bobby Brown, who's now um, the dean of engineering at Colorado University, but was for many years the chief technical officer at NASA and the guy who engineered that crazy sky crane landing of Curiosity on Mars. So um, Bobby and I worked very hard together to try to make sure that everything that was in the dramatic part of it was accurate, reasonable, um, you know, was extremely probable. Um, and then the other half of it, uh, the rest of the time was what we called what, sorry, I would never call anyone this, but what National Geographic called big thinkers. And so that was people like me and Elon Musk and so forth, um, you know, Neil, or, um, you know, we had several astronauts, um, Peter Diamandis, people like that, um, astrophysicists, people who would kind of come in and comment um, on what was being revealed in the dramatic part of the series. And I mean, that's a tough gig, trying to be the science coordinator, the science fact checker, for uh, a dramatization because they're trying to tell a certain kind of a story and and you know how how well did that work out for for the science in the telling it worked story? out extremely well because it was national geographic <laughs> um, yeah. and they wanted to get it right they did not want to be accused of um having any of the science wrong um you know when i did the book um the publisher, which is Simon and Schuster, um, hired a, a full-time fact checker at the New Yorker. And my primary interest in doing the book was that there would be absolutely nothing wrong factually in the book. And so far I haven't found out anything that's wrong, but, um, I'm sure there's something wrong in there somewhere, but we take kind of great pride in making sure that the science is right the whole way around. For example, in the first episode, um, when they're le when the crew is landing on Mars, there's there's a whole trajectory of things, to, a kind of a cascade of events that go wrong during the landing, and every single thing in that is so accurate that when they're searching for a certain circuit board to replace, that's an actual circuit board used in the space shuttle. Um, it would be the exact circuit board that you would use to control a thruster on a rocket like that. So we got it. We got it down to the wire on that stuff. That's that's great, <clears throat> and I and you know this is sort of a feeling that I've had over the last few years, and seeing stuff like The Martian or even Gravity, which had its share of of science issues, that that audiences are demonstrating that they are ready for the right level of science, and in fact they appreciate it. You don't have to go over their heads, you know, you can make a few um, exceptions to the laws of physics occasionally, you know, you get one, right? Or, or in this case, the laws of finances that people are willing to, to spend money on a mission to Mars, but, but the rest of the science can be correct. You know, do you find that that things are moving in that direction? I don't know if things are moving in that direction, to tell you the truth. I mean, you know, one of the 
I really like Andy Weir, who wrote The Martian, and um, Andy was one of the big thinkers in this series. And we had many discussions about how far you could stretch the science and how far the science got stretched in The Martian. And he asked me an interesting question. He said, so did the director or somebody else in the series do something that drove you nuts? And I said, well, there was one thing, which is they have when the lander, when the first uh, rocket lands on Mars with the first crew, um, and there's a thruster problem as it lands, it lands 73 kilometers away from where it's supposed to land. And the thing that nobody would know this, but the thing that drove me nuts about that is that the mission would have aborted if it was going to land that far away from where it was supposed to land. It never would have, it would never have had a parameter of more than 15 kilometers away from, from the original touchdown point. But that's the kind of thing that, you know, that unless you worked at NASA and you worked on the curiosity landing and so forth, you would never guess. So, um, I, I, you know, it, this is a different kind of series and I don't think I would have gotten involved in it from the get go if we didn't have a commitment that we were going to get the science right, no matter what, but there are little things, you know, Andy, you know, Andy did not have nearly as much control over what was going on in the Martian as I was able to have in doing the Mars series for National Geographic. But it's really important to remember that he was writing a novel. He was writing fiction. When I wrote a book, I was writing, you know, it was a journalistic exercise and I was writing fact. Um, and the series was based on a factual book. Um, whereas the Martian is based on a story, you know, it's, it's perfectly within everybody's right to make up um, this stuff. I, I think that the, it was interesting to me that um, there were three movies in a row that I really think kind of brought people's interest in um, space science back. And the first was Gravity and then Interstellar and then The Martian. And in kind of a cascade of forward um, liberties with the science, I would say that Gravity was probably the closest to being real and Interstellar was stretching a bunch of stuff, even though Kip Thorne was the advisor on that, and I have extraordinary respect for him. Uh, and then The Martian was, you know, just kind of a blown out tale. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say actually that those kind of movies are moving in the opposite direction. But I think there's a, you know, there's a real attempt um, on, on cable channels like National Geographic to get this stuff right now. Uh, so let's talk about, you know, you spent a lot of time uh, sort of really understanding the state of, of Mars exploration, Mars missions. Uh, where do we stand now? I mean, I know Elon Musk, when he presented the interplanetary transport ship, he said, this thing, this thing is going to fly in 2024. We're going to, you know, that that's when humans are going to Mars. And so here we are, uh, so, you know, seven, seven years away from those first humans off to Mars and a city of of a million by the end of the century. W you know, based on all the conversations you've had both with Musk and with with other people who are working on this, where do you think we are towards those first humans making that trip? Well, there's a huge difference of opinion on this depending on who you talk to. But let's start with NASA. They've had the technology to do this for 50 years. Um, when the Apollo mission uh, came to an end. Werner von Braun was stalking the halls of Congress and, and tapping on Richard Nixon's door and saying, we've got to go to Mars. I can put people on Mars by 1983. And he probably could have. Um, you know, NASA now has the SLS ro uh, launch system, the Space Launch System rocket, which is um, bigger than the Saturn V. Um, and it's got plenty of power to get the, the Orion capsule uh, which is kind of like the Apollo capsule on steroids. It holds more people, but it's basically the same thing to Mars. So uh, when I was writing the book, um, the head of NASA pulled me aside and said, you know, we have no plans um, to put humans on Mars. And he led me to a, um, to a website, to a NASA website, where it said NASA has no intention of landing humans on Mars at this moment or at, the, at this time. We have no plans to do that. And then the Martian kit, well, first of all, my book came out and then the Martian came out. And then 
you know, a year and a half ago, there was all of a sudden there was a Mars human landing director um, for the first time. And so NASA kind of got in the swing of public opinion on this. Now, here's kind of the truth of what they can do. Um, they haven't even put human beings in the Orion capsule yet. Um, they've only had one test flight of that capsule. Um, they probably, by 2033, could do what I would call an Apollo 8 and orbit Mars, do kind of go out, loop around Mars and come back the same way that Apollo 8 went around the moon and came back. Right. Do the fast uh, free return trajectory. They, they would have to build something they do not have now, which is a hab that would go behind that Orion capsule. That Orion capsule is good for a limited period of time and a limited amount of exposure to the elements. It's not good for an eight month trip to Mars. So they'd have to build a hab, and they've thought about this, and they, they know they would have to have a hab. They'd have to have a hab behind that. Now, probably by 2040, if they wanted to, they could land humans on Mars, and in that case, they would have to build a lander. So they would do this the same way they did the Apollo mission, you know, zillions of years ago. Um, they'd send a three-part system to Mars. They'd... Uh, there would be a habitat, a main capsule that they would re-enter Earth's atmosphere in, um, and a lander on Mars. Um, everybody else who's planning on going to Mars, including the Russians and the Chinese, who have now announced that they, they're going to put humans on Mars, um, everybody else who's announced this has said they're going to use a single rocket, and they're going to land vertically, mm -hmm. and they're going to take off vertically um, when they go back. So... Here's my best guess. My best guess is that um, Musk can't do it by 2024. He was he was originally talking about um, by 2025 um, putting a few people on Mars. But this whole idea of the Mars colonizer rocket that carries 80 to 100 people, I don't think we're going to see that before the early 2030s. The thing that's going to be interesting about that that most people have not quite figured out is that he's not going to build one of those or two of those. He's going to build hundreds of those, possibly thousands, a thousand of those. Um, it will depend on the demand, you know, and, and how many people are actually willing to go and how many jobs there are for them on Mars and, and the kind of infrastructure that's being built on Mars. Um, but, you know, the... The colonization of the Americas by Europeans is a really interesting case in point. In 1620, you have basically one ship comes over with 104 people in it. Two years later, about 20% of them are dead. And yet 20 years later, Boston is a city. And 20 years later, 700 ships sail from England alone to the Americas. So I think you're going to see an escalation of the number of rockets that go and the number of people go is really going to kind of make people's heads spin. And I do think the first people will be on Mars by 2027. I think one of the things that, um, whether it's a Trump administration or a future administration, one of the things, one of the things that American, um, an American president is going to figure out and NASA works for the president is that the Russians are going to put a, a base on the moon, which to me is an absolute waste of time and money. And the Chinese are going to put a base on the moon. And we are going to have to figure out if we are comfortable with not being on the moon. My guess is from a political point of view, we're going to decide we want to be on the moon too. And we're going to build a base on the moon. And that's going to steal a lot of resources for going to Mars. So it's probably more likely that Musk gets to Mars long before NASA does. But eventually, by, say, 2040 or 2050, which is not that far off, there are probably going to be three bases on Mars. There are probably going to be an American base of some sort, whether it's private or not. Um, there's going to be a Chinese base, and there's going to be a Russian base. Or at least the Russians and the Chinese will have landed people on Mars by then. It's interesting to me that you feel like a base on the moon is a waste of of money. I mean... I mean, I, I mean, sort of when we go back and we talk about the the concept of the of the interplanetary transport ship that you know you're going to be loading up hundreds of people on this gigantic ship and you're going to be taking them to Mars and you're literally not, gonna be not hundreds of people, well, eighty to a hundred well, people. Well, over time, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah. I, if the economics of this work out in a in a very interesting way, it costs a lot of money per person to send like six to eight people to Mars, 
it does not cost a lot of money per person to send up to 100 people. Sure. But once you get above 100 people, the, the complexities of the size of the ship and so forth actually makes it, it starts, the curve starts going back up and it starts getting more expensive. So this 80 to 100 person rocket, that's actually a very well thought out right, okay. um, vehicle. Yeah, but okay, a hundred people, eighty people, hundred people that you're going to be taking them to the to Mars, and you're going to be dumping them out onto the surface. That that the intricacies of of every other piece of the puzzle. Where do they go to the bathroom? How do they eat their food? You know, food. How do they get resupplied? How do they make their water, fuel, um, etc. Like there are a a, a ten thousand little details that need to be figured out to live in a place that's as hostile to to life as Mars. You know, I always say like the worst desert on Earth, the most inhospitable desert is a paradise compared to what you would be living in on on Mars, you know, at least you can step outside and breathe. So so it's I, you know, don't you think that the moon is closer and lets us work out those problems in a more iterative process? Well, the, the, you're right, the moon is a 1000 is 1000 of the distance that it is to Mars. The moon is 250,000 miles away. Approximately Mars is 250 million miles away. Um, you know, the Saturn V rocket that went to the moon could actually have gotten there in one day instead of three days. But of course it would have been going so fast, it wouldn't have been captured by the moon's gravity. And we're not gonna send a rocket initially to Mars that's a whole lot bigger than the Saturn V, maybe in thrust value, maybe two to three times larger and in volumetrically for crew, maybe up to 10 times uh, larger. But we, everything that we learned about going to the moon and how, remember, we did not live on the moon. We did not build a base on the moon. Um, and what you're talking about is creating an infrastructure. And that has all been worked out by NASA literally decades ago. We know how to suck in the Martian atmosphere, which is 96% CO2, and split off the carbon atom with a uh, machine called the MOXIE that was a, invented in MIT for NASA. Uh, there's going to be a MOXIE machine on the second Curiosity rover that goes to Mars in 2020 as a test vehicle. And that machine is designed to be scaled up by a factor of 100. That machine makes enough oxygen in 24 hours to keep one human being alive. Or it makes enough liquid oxygen to fuel a rocket for a return trip. So we've, we've already figured out how to get the oxygen. We now know that water is everywhere on Mars. I mean, you know, there's ice in craters. We now think that it may be less than 30 meters below the surface near the, um, the equator that we would find underground water. But let's just suppose it's really hard to find water. And even though the surface of Mars, the regolith, is in some places essentially a frozen swamp, and it's about 60% water, but it's hard as a rock because it's, it's really cold temperatures. It's really frozen. You'd have to like chip it out, put it in an oven, melt it, distill it, etc. So we've got this machine that was invented a number of almost two decades ago called WAVAR at the University of Washington. And it turns out that the Mar Martian atmosphere every night is 100% humid. So this, is, this machine is like two moving parts in it. A fan that pumps in air from from the at night um, that's that's 100 percent humid passes it over a mineral called zeolite which is very common on mars and very common on earth zeolite's like a giant sponge for humidity and so the zeolite absorbs the water then you squeeze this is the second moving part you squeeze the zeolite and the liquid water comes out of it you run it through a distillation tube or uv and you can drink it. so we've you know we've got companies like ball aerospace now has a uh, a blow up hab on the space station right now that it's testing. Um, I saw a, a full size mock up of that at the Johnson Space Center. It's really pretty amazing. Um, I, I don't think there are any habitat um, and living problems on Mars that we can't solve very, very easily with existing technology. You know, we have small nuclear reactors now um, that are the perfect size for like 50 people living on Mars. Um, everything, you know, food, shelter, um, clothing, we've got, um, uh, Dava Newman is now the assistant, uh, or the deputy director of NASA. 
uh, who was at MIT, has invented the spacesuit um, that puts about five pounds of pressure on you instead of the 15 pounds you have on Earth. On Mars, there's none. Um, and it's just enough. And it's woven with metallic um, fibers so that it uh, uh, takes care of most of the radiation exposure that you would get. Everything that we need to live on Mars, whether it's a spacesuit, a habitat, a way to get water, a way to breathe, we have already worked those problems out long ago. So it's mostly a matter of will and money. All the technology exists and all the technology has existed for many, many years to do this. So going to the moon is just like repeating what we've already done. And frankly, it's really easy to do there. And I just don't see that we learn anything by going back to the moon. Well, I think you and I clearly have different uh, sort of opinions of what's difficult but and easy to do. But because um, uh, it's all hard, like space is just it's all it's all murder out there. And I think, you know, the fact that we can get as far as we can and that we have accomplished as much as we have is is kind of amazing and impressive. And I know one of the things that you've said is is the, that a base on Mars, that a human habitation on Mars is kind of inevitable, that that is the future. What, you know, what, what do you think that looks like? When do you think that we've got this sort of permanent habitation on, on Mars? How far and, and what kind of shape does that look like? I think by 2030, um, we probably have a permanent base. Wow. Uh, Based on Mars, well, yeah. with, really without any question. But what about like a self-sufficient civilization? When when do we have a city on Mars that can take care of itself? Well, that becomes much more speculative. But if you could believe twenty percent of what Elon Musk says, and so far he's delivered more like ninety percent, right? Just late. That's he's all. promised. But let's say you could only. You could only count on 20%. He is, he's pretty determined um, that by the year 2050, he's going to launch 1,000 rockets every two years, each one of which has about 80 people in it to Mars. So, because he's fully aware that you need at least a million people on Mars to act. Because you have to, everything you do on Mars, you have to find on Mars and you have to build on Mars. You have to have you know, amazing 3D printers. You, know, you, have to have, you have to actually go out on the surface of Mars and mine stuff that you need. Um, you have to build things like iron smelters. Um, you, you, it's a lot of industry. You yeah. actually have an infrastructure you have to build once you get there. So, and you're going to need a lot of people to do that. So in his mind, by 2050, there are already 50,000 people on Mars, and he's adding to them at the rate of 80,000 people every two years. Now, let's just suppose he's only 20% right. <laughs> <clears throat> that means there's 10,000 people on Mars by 2050, and he's adding at the at the rate of 20,000 people every two years. Um, it's this is like self-driving cars. You know, you're going to turn around, and all of a sudden, there's going to be an app on your phone, and you're going to be able to call a car that will take you wherever you want to go for less than owning a car, and there's not going to be a steering wheel in a car. And people think this is like science fiction. It's 15 years out. It's five years out. It, it, that's why, that's why Bill Ford just fired the CEO of Ford because Ford wasn't moving towards that immediate future soon enough. Um, the same thing is going to happen with going to Mars. It's almost everybody I talk to, even people who know that this is possible and maybe even likely it's almost impossible for people to kind of wrap their heads around the idea that 10 years from now, there'll be human beings on Mars. We just can't quite believe it. Yeah. But, you know, if you go back to the 1960s, nobody really believed we would have a human on the moon by 1970, no matter what Kennedy said. And, and the truth is, <laughs> um, we were lucky that we did. You know, there were so many things that could go wrong. Um, I, I, was, I was talking to Gene Cernan, not long ago, and he said, you know, there was only one Apollo mission in which we did not think we were going to have to scrub it in the middle of the mission, of all the Apollo missions. So it's going to be like that. People are going to die. Um, it's, you know, the history of rocketry is that it works 80% of the time and 20% of the time it doesn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're going to launch, we're going to launch ships to Mars with maybe 80 people in them and bad things are going to happen and they're not going to get there. But I really think 
there are going to be tens of thousands, to answer your question, there are going to be tens of thousands of people on Mars by 2050. Wow. Uh, well, we're running out of time, so I need to give you a chance to do a quick uh, little bit of self-promotion here before we let you go. Uh, one, can we see the book? Yes, I think. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. That's How the book. How We'll Live on Mars, Stephen Petranek. Uh, yep. And then talk a bit about season two. When will people get a chance to see season two? Season two will start next April. Um, it will, just like season one, it will be um, six one-hour episodes. Um, you know, when we started season, season one, nobody really had any concept we'd get to season two. But there will be a season two. And... Um, to put it in a little perspective, it will be, it will take place in the mid 2040s. So, um, it will be when these colonies are starting to build out pretty big and it, uh, will involve completely private, um, uh, groups, um, specifically people who have gone to Mars to make money commercially, um, as opposed to the people who are already there who are there for scientific reasons and, to build a new right. society. Uh, so how can people find out more about you? Where can they follow what you're doing? Oh, that's a good question. Well, you I'll can read always the book, go, of course. You can always go to the TED website. Um, I write for them, and I know you're going to talk about um, Tabby Starr. Um, I wrote a really, I did a really cool interview with her uh, recently for their, for TED's Ideas blog um, about the seven things that could explain what's going on with that star and what her best guess is. Um, so you can always find out more about me at, at uh, ted.com because, and you just look for one of my talks and then there's stuff there. That sounds great. Um, that's a good way. Or watch the show and, and get the book. Yes. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us on the weekly space hangout. Pleasure to have you here. And I look that's forward to your optimistic Martian future. Thank you, Fraser. We'll see you later. Okay. All right, well, it's time to move on with the science component. And as a spoiler alert, we're going to be talking about Tabby Star. So uh, let's see, Kimberly, Dr. Kimberly Cartier. T I tell, I'm telling you, that's the habit. You've already forgotten. Already. Uh, go ahead and, and uh, let us know the new event that's happened this, this week and sure. what's going to be happening. Right. So if any of you tuned into the Weekly Space Hangout last week, at the very end of the program, I mentioned that uh, Voyaging Star or Cabby Star or WTF Star, whatever you want to call it, uh, had started a new dipping event, which is the first one that we had observed since the end of the Kepler mission about four-ish years ago. Uh, so that was very preliminary right when I mentioned it last week. Now that we're about a week later, I have more information about how exactly this came about. So here is what happened. Uh, late last Thursday evening, or very, very early Friday morning last week, uh, there was a group observing Tabby Star uh, taking spectra, and they thought that they observed something a little bit funny. And so they put that's out an funny. amber that's funny. So they put out an amber alert to a bunch of scientists, including Dr. Boyajin, saying, "Hey, this is looking kind of funny. Maybe something's happening. Maybe you want to take a look at it." And a few hours later. Uh, in uh, the more reasonable part of Friday morning, multiple groups at multiple telescopes had confirmed that Voyager star had started dipping again, and it was about a percent dimmer than it had been previously. And that's when everyone went on red alert, the notices went out, and multiple telescopes uh, started observing this event in just about every wavelength region you could think of. Uh, and this, this went on for a full five days, this is this dipping event lasted. And uh, just as of yesterday, maybe a day and a half ago, uh, Voyage and Star had returned to normal. And this one singular dip event seemingly ended. Uh, we're still looking at it, though. So this one event, which is the first one we've seen since Kepler ended, uh, is about a 2% dip in the light coming from Voyage and Star. Comparatively, the largest dip that Kepler saw was about 20%. So this is relatively small uh, compared to that big event, but more online with some of the uh, other events that Kepler observed. Uh, it lasted for a full five days. And we were able to observe it in, like I said, just about every wavelength region 
you can think of from ultraviolet, optical, infrared, microwave, and radio. Uh, we got measurements from uh, Las Cumbres Observatory, from Fairborn Observatory, from Keck, from the SWIFT satellite. Those are just the ones I know about. And a lot of the effort uh, for the past uh, for the past week and upcoming is going to be come, uh, trying to figure out what observations we have from and from which places and trying to calibrate everything so they're all, all we can combine all the measurements together to try and figure out what's happened. Uh, oh, we also had we also got lots of uh, spectra, which is one of the things we really want to want to get spectra of the material that's causing uh, all of these dips. So a lot of the effort upcoming is going to be putting all this stuff together and analyzing it, trying to reduce the data and figure out what exactly we can learn from it. Uh, so what have we learned from it already? Uh, first thing is we've ruled out the idea that the dips that Kepler saw were just because of Kepler instrumental effects. So that was one of the ideas that we had is maybe it was just some failure in, in Kepler that caused some strange dips. Now that we've observed the dips repeating uh, with other telescopes that are not Kepler, we can rule that out. It's not Kepler's fault. It's something that's really happening. That's a good thing. Uh, we can also rule out the idea that maybe it was just a one-time event, because now it's happened again. Other than that, we, can't, we have not been able to rule out any uh, other possible scenarios. Uh, now, Jason Wright did an interesting article just a couple of days ago where he had looked at a couple of possible ideas. Uh, we right. reported on that with with Universe Today. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you get a chance to see what you know what what some of the, like there have been some ideas that had just yeah. recently published before this dimming event? Right. So there are two particular ideas that that were I'm sure that they were put together before this uh, dipping event happened last week, and then attempted to incorporate this new piece of information we have. Uh, the first one, uh, which is actually kind of an interesting one, is the idea that around Voyagin star, there's a very massive planet, something about 30% uh, the mass of the sun, that has a very, very expensive ring system around it, something that, you know, uh, 10 or 20 times the size of the rings of Saturn. And also in that orbit, are groups of asteroids similar to uh, how Jupiter has the Trojan asteroids before and after, but a full Jupiter's mass worth of asteroids in the same orbit as this giant ringed planet, something in like a uh, six AU orbit around Voyage and Star. Uh, and they, this group was attempting to model the previous uh, eclipse events that we saw with Kepler, and they were able to actually model all of the uh, Kepler events that we saw using this giant ringed planet with all the asteroids. And then they, once this new information came in last Friday, they claim that the recent dip event that we just saw is the secondary eclipse of this giant ringed planet where we're seeing the planet actually go behind Voyage and Star and we're losing a lot of the light because perhaps the ring system is very, very reflective. And so we're losing that extra light that the rings are reflecting back to us. Uh, so there are some good things about this about this mo uh, this model. They are able to model all of the Kepler events, which is good. Uh, they can sort of explain this recent event, uh, but the issues are uh, they don't really uh, they don't really explain how such a massive planet with such a massive ring system with all of these. Uh, this Jupiter mass worth of asteroids could actually happen. We've never seen the, uh, that kind of planet with, with that extensive of, of asteroids before. Uh, they don't address the issue of infrared light, uh, where how could you form so many, uh, such an extensive ring system and all these asteroids without also producing a lot of dust in the system, which would shine in the infrared. Right, because they'd be kind of bonking into yeah. each other. And uh, based on the, the size of the planet that they predict caused the, the large Kepler event, the secondary eclipse strength isn't quite right. Uh, for, for a planet that size, you'd expect to see something like uh, one thousandth of a percent for a secondary eclipse depth, and instead we see something about two and a half percent. So those aren't quite, they don't quite match up, but uh, it, what's really nice is that they give they do give predictions of what we could expect to see if we looked at this event in different wavelengths 
and they predict that in a few years time we may see a repeat of the types of signals we saw in Kepler. So uh, what's really nice of that is a testable theory that we could go back and, and try and actually validate or challenge that. So that's really uh, some good things, some, some sort of iffy things, but something we could definitely test for in the near future. Uh, the other idea that uh, was put uh, sort of repeated and, and, and tested a little bit in the past week was the idea that maybe there's something in our solar system, the very, very outer skirts of perhaps the Kepler, uh, the, the Kuiper belt that might be occulting a uh, Voyage and star. And that idea came about because, uh, because there's a potential that there's a periodicity in these eclipse events. Uh, which this is something that uh, Dr. Wright proposed uh, as well a few months ago now, and, and we've talked about before. That one is a little bit more, uh, a little bit less certain, a little bit less predictable, and there are a few issues I think in the math with that one. But we can't completely rule it out either. Yep. So uh, some of the questions we still have, I will say, uh, is we don't know uh, if there's any update on that long-term dimming, that multi-year dimming that we've talked about with Voyage and Star. Uh, but we would need to go back and uh, do a more precise analysis of the photometry that we've gotten to try and figure out where that, how that dimming has progressed. Uh, we don't know if this is a one, a one-time event or if there's going to be a cluster of these events. Uh, towards the end of the Kepler mission, we saw uh, a cluster of these events that were separated by a few days or a few weeks. So now, for now, do we just have the one new event, and we're still monitoring the star to see if this happens again in a cluster of eclipses like we saw before? Uh, we don't know what size the are uh, the objects are that are causing these dips. Maybe it's a group of uh, really really tiny particles, or maybe a group of asteroids that's causing this all at once or maybe it's a single larger object. And that will, we'll be able to figure that out once we know the, uh, the strength of this dip at, at different wavelengths. That'll help us narrow down what size particle or object is causing this sort of dipping. Uh, and we don't know the precise shape of this dip. Uh, a lot of the photometry or light curves you may have seen on Twitter or in different articles are very rough analyses of, of the images that we have. And so whether or not it's a very smooth dip or has a lot of uh, smaller structure within it, we've seen a lot of different shapes for these kinds of dips before. And so we don't quite know what this one looks like. So all this stuff is ongoing. Right. So, you know, like, is the alien megastructure like a Dyson swarm that's composed of individual solar collecting satellites that are, no. you know, is no. the alien megastructure some kind of like interplanetary uh, propulsion no. system? Uh, you know, oh. are we looking at some kind of like planetary dimming? thing because maybe there's too much temperature and the aliens are trying to block some of the filter some of the sunlight to the planet. I can no. see those. No, you still, said the M word. I did not say the I M word. I can still see that there are a bunch of questions about what may there are. this alien megastructure may or may not be doing. <laughs> right. There are still plenty of questions that we can answer and and we've gotten a ton of data that we have not yet had time to go through because it just finished a few days ago and it may start up again soon yeah so, well i mean great timing ongoing. right that yeah, that you got this it. dimming that uh you know there was it's call not... for observations lots of people were able to step up in many different wavelengths of light i mean i love that mm -hmm. call um it was great it went out on twitter yeah but wow. you know it's a great way to do it yeah exactly mm -hmm. and she was like it's dimming observe and and you know and she was like she told keck and she told uh yeah hubble and nasa and then they you know and people were getting back to like we're on it which i thought was just yeah. great so yeah doc so dr boyajan says that you could expect to see uh a paper that discusses all about this discovery in a less than a month or so Wonderful. once we've had a chance to put all the observations together analyze them and come up with some new conclusions. Thank so, you for the big update. That is that is wonderful. We really appreciate that. Uh, we're starting to get low on time, so we got to move on to Paul. We haven't even heard from him, uh, Matt Sutter, yet. Paul. How's it going? You want to talk about gravitational wave memories? <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, you do. And check this out. Check this out. How do you make a gravitational wave? Uh, you move mass. 
you move mass, but it has to be something special. If it's perfectly symmetrical, if say it's a perfectly smooth, uniform ball, that's not going to make a gravitational wave. There has to be an asymmetry. There has to be a bump or two lobes, like two black holes merging together. That's the recipe to make a gravitational wave. But in our mathematical description of gravitational waves, there's multiple levels of, say, accuracy or detail that you can use to describe those waves. So at the first level of accuracy, you can have, uh, say, two black holes mixing together and they generate gravitational waves. But gravitational waves themselves are also asymmetric changes to space-time. So gravitational waves themselves make additional small gravitational waves. There's extra gravitational waves generated by gravitational waves themselves. And when you start going down the rabbit hole of the mathematics, it turns out that as you follow these perturbations to space time to smaller and smaller scales, you're left with something surprising that when a gravitational wave passes over you, the main gravitational wave just may last a little bit, like a microsecond or whatever, it passes over you. But because of the influence on space time of those gravitational waves, they can leave kind of an echo. And if you have a perfectly ideal gravitational wave detector, it can lead to a permanent distortion in that detector. So as the main wave passes by, it may stretch and squeeze, but it may not end up being a perfect circle the exact same way you started with. So in a sense, gravitational waves do distort they leave behind imprints on the gravitational field, we think. That's because these are all further approximations to the mathematics and we haven't dug out all the approximations. So it could be that deep down buried in the mathematics, this isn't a real thing after all, but it appears to be. And why this is interesting is LIGO or our gravitational wave detectors are only sensitive to a certain range of gravitational waves. Now you can't see ones that are too small or too big or too fast or too slow, or they have to get this sweet spot. But LIGO may miss the gravitational wave itself from something that it normally can't see, but it might see these shadow or so-called orphan waves, waves or these uh, more permanent distortions in space-time, those may be down in the frequency range that LIGO can detect. So potentially, if we dig into the data enough and get enough events, we can use LIGO to detect gravitational waves from events that it's not necessarily designed to detect, which is pretty awesome. So, I mean, would it be potentially like catching like ref almost like reflections of gravitational waves. I'm trying to sort of understand. Yeah, it, it's it's a weird thing that doesn't really have an analogy in uh, in in a in many other kinds of physics. So it's it's almost as if if you were to generate a water wave, and as the water wave is rolling through the water that itself is setting up and creating additional waves that trail behind it or push in front of it. And, or sorry, just trail behind it, not push in front of it. I was lying about that part. Um, that doesn't really happen with water waves. This is something that's buried in the mathematics of general relativity. It's, it's called a nonlinear effect uh, because of these gravitational waves. So it's hard to imagine, uh, but that's what math is for. Right. And, and I mean, all of these things, I mean, gravitational waves themselves, I mean, the, the, the sensitivity and the scale of the detectors that exist right now with the LIGO facility and the most enormous collisions and interactions that are possible in the universe mm -hmm. are at the very limits of what the system can, can detect. Oh yeah. That, that we are so far away from being able to make sensitive measurements of gravitational waves. Like we're literally catching supermassive black holes collide into each other. So 
Uh, yeah, no, you're right. It's, it's, it's really beginning to open up this window of gravitational wave astronomy in 10 years, 20 years, when Elon Musk has got his couple dozen people on Mars between 80 and 100 at a time. Uh, this we will have gravitational wave astronomy will be a thing. Uh, some there will be people who will be dubbed gravitational wave astronomers. Whoa. Dr. Nicole <laughs> Gallucci has joined us. Dr. G. That hasn't happened in a while. Hello. What's going on? Sorry, I'm so late. Apparently, it takes a lot longer to get galaxy hair than I anticipated. Um. So is, th is that why you put yourself into the schedule today so that we could uh, be part, you know, participate in your galaxy hair? My unveiling. Uh, no, I literally thought I was going to be completely free from like three to five. <laughs> and I was like, oh, look, I have time. Yeah. No. So this is great. I am, uh, you're all over. doctors now. I'm surrounded oh, by doctors. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, oh. So you, you've you got about four minutes to tell us, uh, to tell us a story. I brought a radio astronomy story. Shocking, right? What a surprise. <laughs> So I, uh, this came across my uh, news feed was from the uh, National Radio Astronomy Observatory's very large array in New Mexico, uh, that Y-shaped array of antennas in the desert, which has uh, in the last few years gotten a major upgrade in sensitivity. Uh, and they pointed it at one of the brightest things in the sky, Cygnus A, one of the brightest radio galaxies, uh, and discovered something completely unexpected. They discovered a second spot next to um, the location where the supermassive black hole is in Cygnus A. And what's weird about this, the Cygnus A is super bright and super close. Um, it was one of the old, like two things I could see when we put, you know, first building a telescope when I was in grad school, we had four antennas and you can see like the sun and Cygnus A and Cass A. That was it, like three things in the sky. But because it's so bright and so well known and was so well imaged by the VLA in the 80s, no one's taken a super close look at it since the 80s or 90s. So uh, in these new observations, they decided, hey, we've got this great new capability on the VLA. We're going to point it at Cygnus A and map out, you know, this gorgeous jet structure and this lobe structure that, that they have there. Um, and they discovered this, this, new, um, this new radio source. So they're looking into what it could be. Um, they've ruled out, you know, background sources, foreground sources. Um, and the two possibilities are that there is a second supermassive black hole uh, orbiting the main one, uh, and that these, I think, would make the closest pair of supermassive black holes, if that is confirmed, uh, or a very bizarre kind of supernova. Now, they've um, tracked this um, new source for over a year now, so it's pretty long-lasting and doesn't have quite the right characteristics and other wavelengths. Um, to be a supernova, it would be really extreme weird supernova, so either a weird extreme supernova we've never seen before, or a second supermassive black hole in the center of this super well-known galaxy that we've never seen before. We need one of those gravitational um, wave astronomers to, to confirm exactly. the, that this possibility. Is their, this is, this is, this one's going to go. This is probably going to be the one to go first out of the ones we know of. Um, so they're going to keep monitoring this. Um, they had to dig through, since no one looked at it in such detail since the late 80s, they had to dig into archived data all across the electromagnetic spectrum to piece together um, you know, when this could have happened and how long it's been there. So they said it's been there at least a year. Um, so that paper is up in Astrophysical Journal, which means you can find it on archive. Um, I don't know where links go anymore. I just opened the Slack channels. I can post that somewhere <laughs> for you. Um, but yeah, it's pretty exciting. And, and at the end of the press release, they talk about how the scientists who worked on this, um, a bunch of folks that I uh, knew in New Mexico, um, were all like students when, you know, the last time that they had imaged this. So they've been working on this source for so long. And that's uh, like dedicating your life to this, to these kinds dedicating of observations. Dedicating your life to radio astronomy. All um, about that. Will the will this team be able to beat the Event Horizon crew to the punch to get an image of a supermassive black hole? Oh, event Horizon? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. They did they did get some time on the very long baseline array. So those are the telescopes spread across North America. 
Um, and they were able to confirm that it's super tiny. It's less than four parsecs, so it's about 12 light years across. Um, but I, it's still too far away um, to be able to resolve the supermassive black hole in the way that the Event Horizon Telescope is aiming to do. Were you part of the Event Horizon Telescope image? I was not, no. Um, but that is uh, partly done at MIT Haystack, and I was a... I was a summer student in 2003. It was my first research project when I heard them talking about this cool project and we're going to be the first to image a black hole and to see how far they've come in that time. It's been really, really amazing. Um, actually, one of my students, um, I think, is working there this summer. Uh, so uh, he might be working on this project as well. well so yeah. Instead of me, it's, it's, now, it's now my students that are... <laughs> coming down the pipeline. I think it's so funny that the, that we're waiting for this image. We're waiting for someone to return the data from Antarctica. Like it's the reason we oh, can't yeah. see the picture yet is because they have no. to bring the data in from Antarctica. That and all the image processing that goes with it. It's super hard yeah. to make an image with so few, you know, baselines. Yeah, I can't wait. It's like having a telescope that's full of holes and you're trying to make a good image out of it so it's it's definitely a challenge yeah yeah fantastic well i'm glad you were able to join us and now we're gonna have to say so goodbye to you come. that's okay <laughs> all right. that's okay i'll be here i mean i'm here all summer so I'm well we're well we're done all summer so i know i know yeah but you've got you know so you're bad. a professor now you got to teach i understand Ooh. all right well let's wrap things up I, you know what nicole you get to tell us where to find out more uh, I'm still a noisy astronomer. Um, most of my stuff, uh, I have uh, noisyastronomer.com. Uh, has not been posting there lately, but I'm hoping to put up some lesson plans so you can have an idea of some of what I've been doing for the last two years as a professor. Uh, so I'll post some fun astronomy lesson plans there. But I'm on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all the things. Fantastic. Uh, Paul Matt Sutter, where do people find out more? At Paul Matt Sutter. Right there. And I just put your Twitter right on the screen. Very cool. Also, pmsutter.com. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Kimberly Cartier. Hey, you did it right. <laughs> uh, people can find out more on Twitter at Astro Kim Cartier and on my website, KimberlyCartier.org. Awesome. Once again, of course, I'm Fraser Kane. There's my Twitter. Uh, check out the Instagram. We're doing really cool takeovers on the Universe Today Instagram. I think you'll really enjoy the cool astrophotography that's going on there. We just posted, if you haven't already, subscribe to this channel. We just posted my latest question show, which was yesterday. Our next episode is coming out literally the next couple of days, maybe, all about fusion power. So make sure if you haven't already, subscribe. We've got some really exciting stuff, including a really cool collaboration coming up with myself and uh, Isaac Arthur, the futurist Isaac Arthur. So stay tuned for all of that. Thanks. I'm going to put everyone back into the Brady Bunch mode. There they all are. Uh, thanks to our all of our... Let's see, there we all are. Thanks to everyone who watched it. Thanks to the crew that's here in the show. And uh, thanks to, the, of course, the WSH crew. These are the really the producers of the show. If you want to join that amazing community, go to wshcrew.space and, uh, and sign up. And then you can be part of the chat. You can help. It doesn't work anymore now that we're Brady Bunch. But... Um, uh, yeah, you can be part of the chat, and you can really be one of the producers of this show. If there are uh, guests that you want on this show, you should join this community, and they'll teach you how to get those guests on the show so, so that we can interview them and talk to them, which is awesome. All right, uh, we're going to do Astronomy Cast in 25 minutes, so everyone who's interested, we'll see you all over there. Goodbye. Oh, we've Bye. got... Bye. And...